I wanted to let you know about a couple of things before we get into our text today. One is that I couldn't find the reference last week, but so I wanted to give it to you this week of a verse that I quoted. It was actually from the message, and I found the reference today or uh, this week. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. And I also quoted the NLT's version of verse 32. And I wanted to let you know also that the illustration of a husband not sitting on a throne and taking up a cross is something I adapted, but I don't know who it is. So I just wanted to share that with you. I can't give them credit because I don't know who it is, but uh, I'm just really sensitive to any kind of thing like that. So it was bothering me. So I want to let you know. Let's, uh, let's pray together as we open God's word. Lord, we give you thanks for your mercies and grace. Thank you for meeting us here already. Thank you that we have an opportunity of, uh, in, in some way of what we're going to be looking at even now. So we're grateful that you've given us that gift even in advance. I pray for your help, Holy Spirit. I'm dependent upon you for your grace. I just uh, ask for your help that you'd be glorified. Your word would be rightly divided and gain a hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the best birthday gifts I ever got was from my Aunt Connie last October. She went back through both sides of my family line, my mother's side and my, my father's side, all the way back to 1500s. And she went through and she found a lot of the ministers or the pastors in our family line. And she gave me a printout with their pictures and a summary of them. I've given you a picture of one of them here. Ron, if you'd bring that up. And she also gave me a printout of a lot of different people who had strong church ties in our family lines. This is the earliest. You see the family resemblance at all? You know, <laughs> probably not. Probably not. His name is Tobias Govertz Van Den Weingart or something like that. He was a Mennonite minister living in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He was an author of four books that were widely read, theological works, and he was one of four representatives of the Church of Amsterdam who signed the Third Mennonite Confession in 1632, and he pastored in the Flemish church for over 50 years. I thought, wow, that's very interesting. I'm, thank you, Aunt Connie. You know, now, you probably don't care because it's not your family, right? <clears throat> but it, it, uh, it was interesting to me. And of course, you don't have to be part of my family line to have pastors and teachers or whatever, right? Pastor Wayne is not a foregrave. I'm not a Sawyer, but we're both called by God. Pastor Tom is not a foregrave, and I'm not a Mott singer, but we're both pastors. And many of you probably have pastors in your family line somewhere down the line, even if you don't know who they are. You could probably find that out if you wanted to, because it's not based on family line or family history. It's, it's based on God's call. But the Levitical priests were different. It was based on ancestral descent. You had to be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest. This brings up a, a question for us then. How is Jesus our great high priest since he was from the tribe of Judah, not Levi? If it's by ancestral descent, and it has to be from the tribe of, of Levi, how can Jesus be our high priest? Because Moses said nothing about priests coming from the tribe of Judah. We find our text in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 14 to begin with. This is the word of the Lord. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of priesthood, there also must be a change of the law. He of whom these things are said to belong, said belong to the tribe, uh, to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. The word of the Lord. We need and we want Jesus to be our high priest, but how is it that he's a priest since he's from the tribe of Judah and not Levi? Yeah, how, how is it? How, how is it? Because no one's ever served at the altar from the tribe of Levi. 
he's not in the order of Aaron, so how is it? And notice that the, the author of Hebrews doesn't pretend that this isn't something that needs explanation. He doesn't just try to gloss over it and say, don't worry about that. No, he, he begins to deal with it, and he begins to point out why there was a need for a, another priest, one in the order of Melchizedek. That's why that reading was read from Genesis 14. You might have thought, why are we reading from that passage on Easter Sunday? Because it introduced Melchizedek, who the author of Hebrews is talking about. And he begins to show the deficiencies of the Levitical priesthood and why there was a need for another high priest. First, in verse 11 and 19, he says, perfection could not be attained through the Mosaic law and priesthood. Now, now this is where our English connotations of words can get us into trouble. The perfection in the Bible does not refer to absolute sinlessness. That's not what it refers to. The J.B. Phillips puts it this way. It is, it is a spiritual maturity. The Levitical priesthood cannot provide that. <coughs> In fact, you see that meaning in Hebrews 6.1. If you turn back there, and I hope you bring your Bibles. Pastor Wayne and I talked about that a little bit in our, in our most recent visit. Take your Bible. I don't want you to be following along with me and, and, and seeing what I'm talking about here. If you look at Hebrews 6.1, you see an example of that meaning of perfection, that it is going on to spiritual maturity. He tells them, what are you guys doing? Wake up a little bit. You're still babies in Christ. You should, you should be growing. You should be beyond this point. Get beyond the basic teachings of Christ and go on toward perfection or spiritual maturity. If you know, if you look at the rest of the, uh, of the book of Hebrews, he's addressing these believers and it's apparent that they've been believers for a little while. Hebrews 10.32 talks about how they had suffered a previous time of persecution, just as they are now. And so they, they've been believers for a little while. And he begins to bring that up to them in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, I believe it is. Yes, and he begins to ask these kind of questions. Or we can put what he says in the form of questions. And it, and it, and it, uh, and it invites us to think about our own relationship with Christ because he's having to warn them of the danger of falling away. They, they, should, they should be showing more spiritual growth in their lives, and they aren't. It should give us pause. You know, um, we need physical checkups, even if we don't want them. In fact, my beautiful wife, Beth, has scheduled me for a physical. I didn't ask her to. She just knew I needed it, and that's part of love, right? She scheduled me for a physical in June. I hate those things, don't you? We don't like physical checkups, but we need them. And in the same way, perhaps we need the Holy Spirit to give us a spiritual checkup this morning. Not to condemn us, not to discourage us, but to say, Lord, is there something that you want to point out to me? Lord, am I an infant in Christ? Am I still unskilled in the word of righteousness when I should be a teacher by now? Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Some of these believers can't handle solid food just as an infant can't handle steak and potatoes. And the, and the author of Hebrews is saying, you need someone to teach you again all over the basics. He's giving them a spiritual checkup. Now, new believers need spiritual milk. <laughs> They've just been born again. They need spiritual milk. But if we've been believers for a long time or a while, the author of Hebrews says, there should be some evidence that you're on some more solid food, that you're being trained in the word of righteousness, that uh, you are growing and the Holy Spirit is transforming you through the renewing of your mind. In other words, he's talking about that Christ not only died for our redemption, but also our sanctification. Also our spiritual maturity, our growing in Christ's likeness, our, our, our growing in depth of, of our relationship with the Lord. Dr. Hahn says the New Testament word for protection means to be all something can be, to fulfill the full purpose of, to be in the process of reaching the goal to which it was created. And he says the author's logic is very simple. 
If God's goals could have been reached through the Levitical priest, then God would have accomplished his goals that way. But God's goals had to go and come through another. One who would come in the order of Melchizedek. Verses 1 through 10, we didn't read them. He gives an introduction to who this this person is. He talks about him a little bit in previous chapters as well. But he gives a summary of that encounter between Melchizedek and Abraham in Genesis 14. And he points out, don't you, don't you see here that Melchizedek was a priest and a king even before the Levitical priesthood even existed? And he says he resembles the Son of God. And then he will turn to, now in the portion we're going to read, to Psalm 110. And the New Living Translation rightly says that this is a prophecy David gives through the Holy Spirit about the need for a new high priest to come. A change in the priesthood. And what he's doing, the author of Hebrews is beginning to make the connections for us to Jesus and to Easter. (laughs) We find our rest of the text here in verse 15 through 28. Look look here in chapter 7. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on, listen, on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it's not without an oath, Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Speaking of Jesus. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. A better hope and a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but since Jesus, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And we're going to refer to verses 26 through 28 here in a moment as well. So keep your Bible open. We'll look at those verses too. There was a need for another high priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not according to to biological descent. And the author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is that high priest. Jesus is that high priest. Look at chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Christ was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Daniel Burdick says Christ is not another Aaron. He replaces Aaron with a priesthood that is both different and better. Jesus' priesthood, did you pick up on it here? I try to emphasize it. Gives us a better hope and a better covenant because Jesus' priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood. You might remember that phrase that we used from Dr. Hahn as we went through the entire book of Hebrews in 2019. Probably not. That was like five years ago, right? But as we went through, we saw how Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. He was a servant. Christ is the son. Jesus is greater than the Levitical priesthood. And I love how the contemporary English version puts it. Jesus is the priest we need. Jesus is the high priest that we need. And he, he, uh, he demonstrates that now in several other ways. In chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. What do the Levitical priests have to do? Day after day, day after day, day after day, offer sacrifices first for themselves and then for the people. And the, the sufficiency of those sacrifices, the insufficiency, I should say, is proved by that, that they kept on having to offer them. That they, they, there was no end to them. This is a second deficiency of the Levitical priesthood that explains why there is another need for a high priest, a, a different high priest. But this is further demonstrated. Did you pick it up here? If you look at these other verses, 
that it's demonstrated in Christ's own sacrifice for us in that his sacrifice is for us once for all. It's an all-sufficient sacrifice. There's not a need for another sacrifice. And he did this by not offering the blood of goats and bulls, but he offered himself. And that picks up on our phrase that we've been working with through all of these letters of Paul and Hebrews. We don't know who wrote it, but it's here, here. It's here as well. Jesus gave himself up for us. He offered himself, not, not an animal, not the blood of goats and bulls. Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what we were giving special attention to Friday night that Jesus truly suffered, died on the cross, and was buried on our behalf. The question is, and Pastor Wayne gave this in a different illustration, but it's the same message. Have you turned to God and trusted Jesus for the forgiveness He died to provide? Alistair McGrath outlines three stages of receiving what Christ has done for us. First, we may believe that God has promised us the forgiveness of sins. Second, we may believe that that promise is true. But third, unless I respond to that promise by the grace he provides, I will not obtain the forgiveness. The first two stages prepare the way for the third, but they are not complete without the third. We'll come back to that. A third deficiency of the Levitical priesthood is that they had to offer sacrifices day after day, first for their own sins, but Jesus is without sin. The deficiency of the Levitical priesthood is that they were sinners. Jesus is sinless without sin, and this is an important uh, truth to highlight because Iris, I meant to ask you this, but she, she posted online uh, several weeks ago a warning about a children's book called The Baptism of Jesus, if you'd bring it up, Ron, by Catherine Solly, that tries to undermine that truth. In that book, she has John asking Jesus, why do you come to the river to be baptized? You should be baptizing me. And she has his answer be, do you see it up there? I have come to the river today to wash my sins away, said Jesus. No, 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 no. No, the scriptures say he came to fulfill all righteousness. He is without sin. He's without sin. It is by his death and resurrection, and and many point out as well, through his sinless, perfect life, that righteousness, right standing with God, is made available to us. Let me give a sidebar to parents here. Parents... Our task today, it's always been a difficult task, but it seems like the age we're living in has made it a very, very difficult task. Sarah Junks in her book, great book, Sharing Faith with Children, on the basis of the work of James Fowler says, part of our responsibility as as, as parents, especially for ages three to six, it applies beyond that, but especially ages three to six, is is to manage or take hold of and and filter through all the images and stories that our children are receiving and that are shaping their fertile imaginations. And as they grow older and they, they have devices and such, that gets even harder because it's almost impossible, it seems like, to stay ahead of the curve on that with all the technology that's available, all the images that they're seeing. And God help us when a book that's supposed to be Christian tells a falsehood about Jesus. Jesus is without sin. Without sin. And it is through His sacrifice that we are provided for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is unlike the other, the, the other priests. They were sinful. They had to offer sacrifices for themselves, verse 26. Not so with Jesus. He offered himself once for all, not for his own sin, but for ours. Hebrews 4.15 gives another affirmation of that. We have a high priest who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. (laughs) Jesus Christ is the high priest we need because he is without sin. He's holy, blameless, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, the text says. 
This leads to the final deficiency that the author of Hebrews points out about these Levitical high priests. And this leads us and brings us to Easter this morning. You might have wondered that. Where is he going with this Levitical priesthood stuff? On, it's Easter morning. The fourth deficiency of the Levitical priesthood, the text says, is that death prevented them from continuing in office. They, they couldn't stay in office because they would die. <laughs> they, they, would, they, they, would, they would die. There was an end of their service, of their priesthood. Jesus, Jesus though, is a forever high priest. The, the, uh, the, this explains why there was a need for another high priest in the order of Melchizedek. That is a forever high priest. And Jesus is that forever priest, is what the text is saying, what the author of Hebrews is saying. He is saying Jesus is the high priest that we need because Jesus overcame and conquered death through his death and resurrection. Jesus lives and reigns forever. His priesthood is permanent. You know, we have this vote coming up in April and then one in November. There's not going to be any vote about Jesus' priesthood. There is no term limits on Jesus' priesthood. It is permanent because he lives forever. So this declaration that the author is making, you are a priest forever, is an Easter declaration. Because Jesus lives and reigns forever and ever. Verse 16 says, Jesus isn't a priest through the legal requirement concerning physical descent, but through the power of an indestructible life. What that means is that Jesus will not and cannot die again. He is our priest forever. So what is the result of this? Consequently, as our forever high priest, Jesus is able to save us. As a result of his superior priesthood, Jesus is able to save for all time those who approach God through him. In fact, he's the only way to the Father. John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus alone provides our salvation. And we might not understand all the nuances of the biblical priesthood that the text brings out here. But Dr. Hahn says superiority, the superiority, the reliability of Christ as the only authentic access to that we have to God is still important. It means that Jesus is our great high priest, the only mediator between God and humanity. It's only in him that we find and have and can receive the forgiveness of sins and salvation. And I mentioned those three stages of faith earlier, Alex McGrath uh, talked about, and he he, talks to, he, he gives a further illustration of that. He says, think about some penicillin. Now, this isn't penicillin, but the point is the same. This is a torvastatin for my high cholesterol. He, he says, think about penicillin when it was first invented by, what was his name, Alexander Fleming or something like that, I think it was. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I got that right. He, he first produced it for clinical, clinical use in in uh, Great Britain, and it saved a good many people's lives from all kinds of blood poisoning. And, and he says, think about the stages of faith in this way. You can believe that this bottle exists. Here it is. It's right here. I can hold it in my hands. And you can believe that what's contained in there will help you with whatever it's supposed to help you with. You can believe that this atorvastatin will lower my cholesterol. The doctor told me that, and it has proven to be true. But unless you take the medicine. It's not going to help you. You can believe that the penicillin will help you. You can believe it will serve that purpose, but unless you take it, it won't help you. It's this third element of faith which is of vital importance in making sense of the cross, he says. Just as faith links the bottle of penicillin to the cure of blood poisoning, so faith forges a link between the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ and ourselves. Faith unites us with the risen Christ and makes available to us everything gained through his death and resurrection, his obedience. So won't you receive the benefits of his once for all sacrifice. It happened. He gave himself once for all. 
He gave himself up for us. He died to provide for the forgiveness of sins. And we can believe that's true. We can believe that. I, I thought about this one too. Some people say, yeah, I believe in God. Well, great, even the demons believe that and shudder, James says. No, no, no. Have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Other words, uh, and otherwise, it's just something he's done for us, but we have not received it. We haven't entered into a relationship with him. Without his perfect sinless life and death and resurrection, we are sin sick, lost, going our own way. But we are who he came for. So won't you turn to him in repentance and follow after him and walk with him in the newness of life that he's given you in Christ Jesus? If the musicians would come. There's one other result here that I would point out about Jesus' forever priesthood. Uh, because he is a great high priest without sin, chapter 4 of Hebrews says he can help us in our time of need. Look at those verses, chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's another promise we're given here. It's another promise. He promises grace and mercy in our time of need, whatever that need might be. You know, we spend so much time fretting and worrying and striving and trying to figure things out on our own. When he says, come to the throne of grace, you'll find what you need for the moment. Maybe it's that you have realized that you you, uh, you need a spiritual checkup. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit would help do that work in your own heart and life this morning. Or it might be that you have a, you have a, a physical need, and we prayed for many of those this morning. Or you have some kind of financial need, or whatever it might be. You have a need, and the invitation is to come to Him with that need, and the promise is. This, you know, when we went through this, when we preached through Hebrews, I just wondered, why, why don't we come to the throne of grace? Why do we try to hold on to that for so long? When the invitation is to come to the throne of grace in confidence that he will give us grace and mercy. We're going to stand and sing because he lives. And you would, I would invite you to respond to the Holy Spirit, how he's speaking to you. And that might mean that you come forward this morning to the altar and we'll pray with you and for you and counsel with you. But let's stand and sing in, in response because he lives.